Michael Hernandez, the Senior Director of Governmental and Public Affairs at the Truman National Security Project, and David Crane, the head of the Syrian Accountability Project at Syracuse University. Welcome, Michael and David, to the Thank show. Thank you. Now, Michael, I want to start with you. Why are the Geneva II peace talks so important for the Western powers? What can they expect to get out of them? I think it's important because you have a regional crisis. You have hundreds of thousands of refugees, which, of course, is a global conflict, and no one wants to see these refugees. But also, it's in a very, very volatile part of the world. You, the, American, uh, the American military and our diplomatic corps was invested in Iraq for almost 10 years. Uh, you still have the Afghan conflict. They all tie in together because the Syrian conflict is directly affecting Iraq right now. And some of the issues that you see in the western part of that country in Al Anbar. And of course, there are many different issues when you look at what the Russian uh, uh, government would like to see and what the American government would like to see. Vladimir Putin and his probably want to see Bashar al-Assad stay in power, whereas the American government prefers some kind of democratic transition where the Syrian people would actually be able to vote for whom their leaders are. That, I think, is the main conflict between the United States and folks like Russia and other countries that support their point of view. David, I want to ask you a question. Earlier this week, there were some very graphic photos of torture in Syria that were released. I just want to warn our audience that they are indeed very graphic, but we felt compelled to show them to you. David, you're one of the lead examiners of, of these photos. Um, so I just want to ask you, are they a reflection of just how rampant war crimes have become in Syria? Yes, these are. Uh, this is direct, uh, specific evidence that shows uh, the cynical nature by which Assad uh, views his people. Uh, he's not interested in them. He's interested in staying in power, and he'll kill as many as he can to do so. So this is direct, specific evidence of a killing machine that's been going on for two years. Uh, resulting in the deaths of over 11,000 human beings. David, today uh, the Syrian government came out saying that the photos were fake. Uh, also, the timing of the photos is very suspect because many critics argue that they were released to undermine the Geneva II peace talks. What do you think of that, of those allegations? Well, again, one, the photos are, uh, uh, have been forensically reviewed by both forensic pathologists, a forensic anthropologist, and an expert. Uh, in photographic imagery, and they said that these photos cannot be faked. In fact, uh, this is important for your listeners to to note. Uh, our chief uh, forensic pathologist said that it's it's harder to fake the moon landing than actually land on the moon. And he used that as analogy. You cannot fake this kind of horror in these pictures uh, at all. So these pictures uh, we carefully examine. They are valid. They are provable and very, very specific. Where does As Assad to the timing of the report... I'm sorry to, to interrupt you. Where does Assad stand in all of this, David? Well, certainly uh, this is uh, indicative of uh, his systematic targeting of civilians, which is a classic definition of a crime against humanity. Michael, I want to turn to you now. Do you think the Geneva II peace talks will end in an epic failure? Uh, the Syrian foreign minister is already saying that the, they don't have serious uh, talks today. They might leave tomorrow on Saturday. I don't want to be a pessimist, but ultimately they already got off on the wrong foot. You don't have a united opposition. There were several members of the opposition that said that they were not going to take part in the talks, number one. Number two, I really don't think that the Syrian government is serious. Uh, there's not going to be any kind of democratic transition, and they're still denying to a certain extent that they've even used, for example, chemical weapons to eliminate uh, civilians. You're talking about thousands of civilians who have been killed by chemical weapons. The United States and Russia brokered a deal to, in order to uh, exterminate the chemical weapons, but even that process is, hasn't been completed. It's very, very challenging when you have two polar opposite views and a fractured opposition, which, as we've been documenting throughout news, the news cycle going back into last summer, there are legitimate forces within the opposition that want a new government, and there are those that are troublemakers, that are foreign jihadists, that have infiltrated them. So it's very difficult for the United States and others to tell who is a legitimate member of the opposition wanting a new government and who are the folks that want to establish some kind of al-Qaeda stronghold in Syria. David, I also want to ask the same of you. There was so much hope pinned on these peace talks. Do you think that Geneva II has already failed in a way because they haven't been able to reach a broad agreement? And I guess they're just discussing about agreeing on small issues at this point. 
Well, I wouldn't use the word hope. I think that there was an opportunity that perhaps there might be some further discussion related to a process. And so uh, I'm not sure that anybody really realized or even have a sense of where this is all going. It's very much like a kaleidoscope. One thing changes and everything changes. Michael, you were recently in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq. Do you think that people on the ground uh, in Syria were really paying attention to the Geneva two peace talks, or are we just seeing, uh, you know, huge amounts of, of refugees fleeing this country? We're seeing refugees, and yes, they are paying attention. Maybe not uh, the common citizen that's worried about getting a job necessarily, but the vast majority of folks are paying attention because it is impacting parts of Iraq. Uh, Fallujah and Ramadi, two cities where many Americans died in some of the, mo of the most intense urban combat since Vietnam. We saw Fallujah fall. Uh, it is now in the hands basically of ISIL uh, and, and other Al-Qaeda aligned uh, affiliates. Uh, and you see parts of Ramadi who have also lost, the Iraqi government has lost control of. So it is important to the Iraqis. It may not be the number one issue, but it's certainly important to them. And around the region, you're seeing other countries taking in some of these Syrian refugees. I mean, millions of, people's, uh, millions of people who are leaving their homes, leaving everything, and going into new countries and having to acclimate, which puts pressure on governments throughout the region. So I think people are paying attention. Of course, everything's local. If they're worried about other things, that's not the top issue. But they are paying attention, whether in government or just a common citizen. So you were recently in Iraq, a country that also has a mixed Shia and Sunni population. What mistakes can be avoided from the Iraqi experience if Assad were to leave Syria? I think the main issue is, you know, for whether you agree with uh, the U.S.-led invasion or not, there was a system that was set up, and Iraq has had two, almost, uh, I think, three successful elections now going into a fourth. The fact of the matter is, in Syria, we haven't had that, and that's very challenging if you don't have a model. Uh, the United States and, and countries that were in the area in Iraq, they tried to set up a system which is representative of the electorate. You don't have that in Syria. I think what you can learn, what the Syrians could learn, if there is a change in government, is how democracy works at the most local level. Folks that elect their most, uh, their, their town councilman, a mayor, etc. Until there is some kind of democratic model for them to follow, it's going to be very challenging. And you can't have that with Bashar al-Assad in, in power. It's just, as of right now, maybe some others that disagree with me, but Mr. Assad in power, it's just not going to happen. David, and one last question to you. What do you think the real solution here is going to be? Are we looking at a political, at a military, or at a ceasefire type of solution? I don't see a solution at all, to be quite honest with you. Uh, there is not a win-win or a win-lose situation. It's all a lose-lose. It's just a matter of how much loss uh, can we uh, manage. Uh, I've heard talk that uh, the West is quietly thinking about leaving Assad in place because the alternative is horrific. Uh, there is no alternative at this point. And so the challenges are many and many, but we also have to understand uh, that we need to continue to move forward, try to seek some kind of solutions, but this is going to take five to ten years, uh, not an immediate solution, which diplomats tend to want to do and move on. This is a long-term, decades-long uh, adjustment and shift uh, there in the Syria, and of course, not just Syria, uh, but in the Middle East itself. Thank you so much, David Crane and Michael Hernandez. We'll be right back. This is America.